Sometimes we talk our way into trouble. Other times we try to talk our way out of it. This, this is 570 News Midday, simulcast on Rogers TV, Cable 20. Back, Fight 70 News Midday. Glenn Peltier filling in. Joining me now live in studio, Canada's 23rd Prime Minister, a year and a half into his current majority government mandate. A man who will mark 10 years as an MP in October in town today for a host of events, taking time out of a very busy and tight itinerary to join us on 570 News Midday. Mr. Prime Minister, uh, I understand the time is quite literally of the essence, so let's get straight to it. You began your day today with a stop at Vidyard this morning in Kitchen, one of the high-tech jewels and success stories here in the region. The local tech sector reacted quite favorably to Mr. Morneau's budget in March, a budget that allocated nearly $1.2 billion for innovation and training, including job skills. Chris Plunkett of Communitech called it, quote, very positive. And there are a lot of unfilled jobs in the tech sector in Waterloo Region uh, right now. Can you tell me specifically how the budget will impact the local tech sector? Uh, well, first of all, we recognize that, that the tech sector yeah, here in KW, but uh, across southwestern Ontario, across Canada, is uh, an extraordinary great driver of good jobs and growth for our communities and our economy. So uh, making sure that there's access uh, to capital, making sure there's access uh, to the global talent pool that's important to be able to draw on, uh, and uh, opportunities to support uh, young people going through STEM education, uh, encouraging coding in K-12 to education, uh, making sure that there's pathways for folks who are maybe not in the tech, se- tech sector but want want to go back to school because they see that's where the jobs are going, uh, that we're actually supporting that. That was really at the core of Budget 2017, uh, to empower citizens to be part of uh, this innovation agenda. You mentioned capital. Venture capital is so important to that sector. What, if anything, was included uh, in the budget to help kickstart the tech sector on that front? Well, a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of capital cl- comes, comes in internationally. I mean, I was talking to uh, uh, Mike Litt of, uh, of, uh, of Vidyard, who was saying that most of uh, their capital was uh, investors from, from Silicon Valley, from California. There's still a capacity to draw there. And that, for me, really highlights the integrated nature of the Canadian and American economies and how uh, what we have here is uh, advantages that you don't see in, in Silicon Valley. Whether it's the diversity, whether it's the quality of life, the the young uh, uh, young entrepreneurs starting up and being successful, uh, there's a, a lot of excitement here. And finally, on the tech file, among the initiatives included in the budget was a program actually announced before the budget uh, called Global Skills Strategy. The goal is to fulfill the labor needs of companies by easing restrictions at the border on highly skilled workers from abroad. How does it work? Well. Uh, we know that there are companies, whether it's a, a, a big a big company deciding to do more R&D in Canada or setting up an engineering office in Canada, that they often want to bring over their top folks uh, to lead that new uh, new office or new, uh, new institute or new whatever. Uh, what that means is you get people come in who then train up Canadians, who hire some of the great Canadian graduates that we have, uh, and bringing in one person or a handful of people from overseas uh, can lead to 100 jobs, and that's uh, where we feel it's exciting uh, for Canada's growth. All right, Mr. Trudeau, your government tabled legislation a couple of weeks ago that will legalize marijuana next year. Have you smoked marijuana since becoming Prime Minister? Uh, I have not. Uh, as I've highlighted many times, I'm uh, more of a bourbon and beer kind of guy. Uh, I'm, I've never, never particularly liked marijuana. Will you partake in the summer? It's not my plan, no. Okay. You have said that the intent of the marijuana legislation is not to encourage the use of recreational cannabis, but rather to protect our kids. How will it do that? Well, we know there's no black market for beer. Uh, we know that there uh, is right now, it's easier for young people to get their hands on a joint than it is for, to get their hands on a cigarette, uh, to buy a cigarette. So uh, we know that by legalizing and controlling it, we're going to actually make it more difficult for underage Canadians to access it because right now we have a failed system where young Canadians have easier access to marijuana than any of 29 different countries around the world. Uh, And on the other hand, we know that criminal organizations, organized crime, street gangs are making billions of dollars a year through the sale of illegal marijuana. Mm -hmm. So by controlling it, by regulating it, uh, we protect Canadians, we protect communities. When are sales for casual use expected to begin and what have you communicated to police services across the country about how to handle the stuff in the interim uh, in the interim the law remains the law uh, we uh, we have not 
uh, move forward on decriminalization or any uh, softening of the laws until we replace it with the right regime. I think it's important that people understand uh, that until it's legal, uh, when they purchase marijuana, uh, they're still contributing to organized crimes profits. All right, Mr. Trump recently assailed the country, our country, over free trade, saying, and I quote, Canada, what they've done to our dairy farmers is a disgrace. Our farmers in Wisconsin and New York are being put out of business, end quote. This morning, he was back at it again. He tweeted, quote, Canada has made business for our dairy farmers in Wisconsin and other border states very difficult. We won't stand for this. Watch, unquote. He was referring to government intervention to control dairy prices in this country. A couple of weeks ago, Canada lowered the price of domestically produced dairy products, undercutting some U.S. producers, potentially leaving some of them in the States out of work. How vigorously are you willing to defend Canada's dairy policy, notwithstanding Mr. Trump having a cow about it? I will always uh, defend Canada's interests, and I think that's something that Canadians expect of me. And uh, we know that there's not a a global free market for agriculture. Every country uh, heavily subsidizes in different ways. We actually don't subsidize our dairy farmers. Uh, We have a supply management uh, system that works very well and has worked for a long time. There have always been uh, questions back and forth uh, in the Canada-U.S. relationship on uh, things like dairy, on lumber. Uh, They go back beyond my father's time in government. So uh, uh, this is nothing new, and this is part of uh, the relationship that is positive, that is deep in so many different ways, that uh, we will deal firmly and reasonably with uh, with them on irritants. Just yesterday, Mr. Trump indicated that tariffs of about 20% would be imposed on Canadian lumber imports and would be retroactive for 90 days. Quebec and B.C. have condemned the move. The B.C. Lumber Trade Council says if duties are completely without, the duties are completely without merit because the U.S. lumber industry can't actually meet the demand for lumber in the U.S. What do you say to Mr. Trump on that file? Uh, we will uh, continue to point out that uh, that Canada is uh, is a, a country that is happy to compete on a, on a fair world, uh, world stage. Uh, we will defend Canada's interests. Uh, this is something that I've, I've heard from premiers. I'm going to be uh, chatting with premiers later uh, to, talk to, to talk about what we're doing and what our approach will be. Uh, and then I'm going to talk to President Trump and uh, we're going to emphasize that uh, we have a deep and strong relationship, and we're going to work through uh, the irritants that we're okay. facing. To Syria now, confusion continues to reign. The civil war continues in the wake of the chemical attack by the Assad regime on his own people. After the attack, you said, quote, we need to move as quickly as possible towards peace and stability in Syria. That does not involve Bashar al-Assad. What did you mean by that? And are you stopping short of suggesting that he should be removed from power? I think we all recognize that uh, there is no military solution, uh, uniquely military solution to the civil war that's been raging in Syria for the past six years. Uh, The international community needs to uh, come together and be very thoughtful in the way we uh, support uh, and move towards peace for the for the Syrian people. I don't think there's uh, any expectation that in the medium or or long term, uh, Bashar al-Assad, who uh, committed war crimes against his own people by uh, uh, gassing. uh, his uh, gassing innocence uh, is going to be able to, to stay in the medium or long term. A couple term. of more questions. To what extent do you think Russia must be held partly responsible for the attack? And how far are you willing to go to censure the Russian government? Well, we already have a very strong uh, regime on sanctions uh, against Russia. and We're going to continue to work with our international allies to ensure that those uh, sanctions are effective and and perhaps increased on this. I think Russia needs to ask itself some very serious questions about uh, its support of uh, of, uh, Assad's regime, uh, as do other countries that support the Assad regime. Final question, and then I want to share something with you, if you have time. You were born in Ottawa. You live in Ottawa. You took French immersion at Rock Cliff Park Public School in Ottawa with Matthew Perry, but that's another story. Can you tell me, Mr. Prime Minister, why the Edmonton Oilers will win the Stanley Cup? <laughs> Connor McDavid. <laughs> Two words, Connor McDavid. I'll leave you with this. I must tell you that when I was much younger, I used to do an impersonation of your father when he was Prime Minister. He was one of my heroes. In November of 1982, I appeared on an open line radio show in this city during which I took calls from listeners who thought they were speaking with your father, Pierre. The radio station got a call from the PMO after they were alerted by then Kitchener Liberal MP Peter Lang to what was going on. And the PMO called the radio station, asked us to clarify that it was not Mr. Trudeau. It was a send up. I have not done my impression of your father in over 30 years. I would like to do that for you now, and I would like to close with a quote from your father, if I may. Would you allow that? Please. It is a comment he made in a classic showdown 
with a CBC reporter outside Parliament. In October of 1970, during the height of the October crisis, the reporter, I would say, assailed Pierre Trudeau at the time and tried to get to him. The reporter had no idea who he was tangling with, and here's part of what Pierre Trudeau had to say. Well, there are a lot of bleeding hearts around who just don't like to see people with helmets and guns. All I can say is, go on and bleed. It's more important to keep law and order in society than to be worried about weak-kneed people who don't like the looks of a soldier's helmet. At any cost, sir, how far would you go with that? How far would you extend that? Well, just watch me. Mr. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you. Thank you. Our guest has been Justin Trudeau, the 23rd Prime Minister of Canada. This is 570 News Midday on Rogers TV and 570 News.